events where all of the creative community was invited and we created kind of topics of interest so that they were of interest to whoever happened to be in the room to hopefully that that informal communication started to work and people could start to learn to trust each other. But it has been, in, in, as we talk to our colleagues in the Creative Economy Coalition around the country, the single most challenge those organizations have found is to, um, uh, to expand the thinking and the horizons of frankly, that the, most of the nonprofit arts or some of the nonprofit arts organizations to think there is a value in my being creatively connected to whether they're independent creatives or the for-profit creative businesses, even if it's just finding, you know, new donors or, or new connecting points, much less finding um, new opportunities. A, an example, this doesn't directly relate to a nonprofit arts organization, but example of what happened in what happened in a lot of these companies when we introduced the research we did like you did your research uh, a guy came up to me and he was the ceo of a flooring manufacturer in a uh, county mm. south of milwaukee and i said what in the world are you doing here why did you get here and he said well i'm a small business i've been following this work he said i can make anything i can make any kind of floor out of a particular material he said what i don't have is the design talent what, what I don't have is the capacity to, to grow it. So by the time that evening finished, she had met a, a, not only a visual artist who then ended up having a residual uh, royalty for developing a pattern, but also he's now brought in other artists. So it's, it's beginning, as I said, it's changing the conversation. If you're willing to get in a room together and start to talk about what some of the issues are and some of the opportunities, it, but it, it, it takes time, and I think you're right. I think there's a lot more people don't want to be pigeonholed. I mean, that photographer doesn't want to be pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. Who am I? I'm a creative. Mm -hmm. And it takes constant connecting and con connecting and networking and networking and hopefully catching the attention of those people making economic investment decisions. Thank you, Christine. Christine will be with us for the rest of the day. Thank you for being with us. On to Thanks. The <laughs> So um, while we have our panel of respondents come up to the stage, if all of you all can start moving, our great pan next panel join us on stage. There are a couple of things that I'd love to um, talk to you all about. I think that um, in our your program, uh, you all in the first page, the, the srscampuslabs.com is actually um, part of a, um, a mechanism in order for you to start responding to us directly. Um, our first question is actually up and live, um, and it is about what is your most important goal today? I think that Christine has already talked about learning. We've also, this la the last story was about networking. Um, and so it is now up to you all in order to help, uh, this is the, the panel in order to help launch to understand how this polling works so if you all need to go to either a web um, a web page which is srs.campuslabs.com and then it's going to ask for your name your first name last name you could give yours or you can make one up and then it asks for the uh, connect id which is 8569 as soon as you add that you should have this on your screen and then you can like this question on the screen and then you can start answering so we now have seven people who, oh, who have figured out how to work this um, hopefully, you will have more people as you do this. But um, as, as you all um, answer that question, there are a few things that I wanted to also bring up, is that um, this, I forgot to mention um, and thank the College of the Liberal Arts and Social Sciences and the New College of the Arts and the Houston Endowment and um, the Center for Public History Lecture Series. Without them, um, this whole thing would not have been able to be happening. And without you and your support, we would not be able to be having lunch and the fabulous little gifts. So we now have still seven people who have, oh, actually, who have answered the question. Um, pardon me? If you look in the front page of your program, it has right there um, five line is participate in live polling srs.campuslabs.com so hopefully if i get a few more responses then we can actually one of the other things that i'd like to do you have index cards on your table and uh part of that is that i want we are asking you to be thinking about this question throughout the entire day is um how do you want the creative economy to be advanced in houston or in your city 
and what are the steps you are taking to move that forward? Those are the questions that we will come back to throughout the entire day in order to ask and hopefully move forward as uh, in toward action throughout uh, the afternoon. Um, so I think I have not that many other responses, but we're going to move on off of this question into the next question. How important is it for Houston or your city to develop its creative economy? Oh, we now have people who've answered that question as well. So. Um, Keep on going. So this will be live throughout. You can continue to answer during this poll, uh, during this panel, um, that question. And now I'm going to. And in your program, you will also have a, the fuller bio, uh, bios for each of our speakers. And um, on that note, I will turn it over to Jonathan. Thank you, Sixto. So we have a stellar panel with us to spend a um, a bit of time to talk about. Um, creative economy from their perspectives, very diverse backgrounds. Um, what we'd like to do is set up the panel with the larger conversation, the larger question of what are the ramifications of thinking of ourselves as a creative economy in Houston um, from each of your perspectives. Um, with that said, what I'll do is I'll introduce each of the panelists. Um, each of them will have a few minutes to um, stop, excuse me, speak to the subject, and then we'll open it to Q&A with all of you. Uh, so with that said, I would like to introduce our very impressive panel. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Vikram, Vikram Maha, Maha, Mashri. Mashri. I already went through that once, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, assistant Professor of Economics, uh, received his BS in Economics and Math from MIT, his PhD in Economics from the University of California at Berkeley, and has completed a postdoc at the University of Rochester. His fields of interest include political economy and public economics. Alfred Cervantes is the Deputy Director for the Houston Film Commission. His role with the Film Commission is to promote the greater Houston, Texas, and Harris County area to film producers, production executives, and independent filmmakers to scout locations and facilitate any production's local filming experience. Kelly Anderson Staley is an assistant professor of photography and media at University of Houston. Previously, she juggled commercial work daytime jobs and her independent art career. Her images are now in permanent collections of the Library of Congress and MFA, and has appeared in New York Magazine and Esquire Russia. Love to see that. Um, in addition to many uh, sites here in Houston. And finally, Deborah Colton, uh, founder and director of Deborah Colton Gallery who has been an active force in the Houston art scene since moving back to Houston from Asia in 2000. With public space exhibitions downtown to support the Asia Society, and then starting the, the, the momentum in the area now called First Ward Arts District by opening the Deborah Colton Gallery there in 2004. Um, I wasn't here, but I hear it was the center of the universe for a few years. I wish I would have actually been able to visit the gallery. The gallery has focused on providing a forum through connecting Texas national and international artists to make positive change and to help Houston become a destination city for the arts. Deborah has used her gallery as a vehicle to enhance the city's art community and has supported many of our art nonprofits through events there. She has also been an active participant in the Houston Art Fair as a way to promote the city nationally and internationally. The gallery is currently exhibiting Suzanne Paul's Proof, which highlights much of Houston's art history for over three decades, and Russian artist Oleg Dow's Broken Mirror, both in support of Photo Fest. And I do want to underscore over there is Deborah has been one of the most outspoken supporter of um, the city's image as a global destination for the arts in many, many, many ways. And we really thank her for all of that work. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it right over to the panelists. 
Um, we're going to start to, with Vikram, who is going to uh, speak for the first round. It's all right if I go up there. See the, Absolutely. Hi. Um, I think I had some slides. Center. It's a PDF. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is I want to take um, a bit of sort of a, a bigger picture look at what it means to be um, sort of the role of creativity, um, how, a, how a labor economist might think about it. Um, and so my uh, brother-in-law, he's a painter. He hangs up his paintings in galleries around the country and sells them for way more than I could afford. Um, and I think everybody would agree that this guy has a creative job. This is a creative job. Um, my brother, he works at a biotech startup in, uh, in Boston, and he engineers yeast to make um, medical and, and high-value chemicals. And I think a lot of people might not immediately think about that as a creative job, but I can't really imagine any cogent argument that could be made to say that that's not a creative job. So, so it's important to think about what it is that, that makes a creative job. And oh, I can't really read what's up there, unfortunately. But um, we can sort of think about. <laughs> so we can sort of think about uh, a few different things. Um, uh, something in creative job is good when you can think about it as what kind of uh, firm you're working in. And the firm is the answer to this. Uh, so you can use something that creates a product. Thank you. Um, somebody who is a, a producer of a service might be creative. Um, but there, I think a barber, everybody would agree, is creative. But a surgeon is, while very well paid and, and a high status job, is not, I don't think, is as creative as a barber. Um, so, so that's kind of a hard thing to, uh, to use to define it. Somebody who creates knowledge, I think everybody would agree, is creative. Um, and people who disseminate knowledge, some people are creative, um, I think. Inspiring teachers, they're using really uh, interesting techniques to get things across, but boring teachers are not really that creative. So I think even within a particular occupation, it's hard to know what a creative job is and what isn't. So this is a really tricky problem. Um, and so I think one way uh, people are starting to try to think about what makes a creative job is let's sort of break up this job into tasks. What are the constituent tasks that go into jobs? Um, and maybe that'll shed some light on it. And so uh, one of the first approaches people took was, let's think about manual, jo manual jobs versus non-manual jobs. Maybe that'll tell us something about creativity. And eh, that's eight years or so, right before the Great Recession and in the aftermath of it. And, and you see these two things, the, the creative jobs and the good jobs, you're, just, you're starting to see a bit of a convergence. So, so here, this is our, these are a couple of researchers. Um, 
that sort of broke down employment by tasks um, in terms of whether they were manual or cognitive tasks and whether they're routine or non-routine. And you'll see that starting at that 0%, that's in 2001, and the shaded sections are the recessions, um, you've seen that there's been a tremendous amount of job growth in, in non-routine manual jobs and non-routine cognitive jobs. And there's been a tremendous amount of job loss from routine cognitive and routine manual jobs. So basically, we see that great recession right there in uh, 08. Almost all the job loss in, in that recession is from routine jobs, and those jobs don't appear to be coming back. So there's now this connection between creative jobs, which we think are non-routine jobs. Creative jobs are doing pretty well. Um, and we can see in other ways, so this is, this is employment in, uh, in routine jobs. You see these huge declines in every recession. This is going back to 68. Huge declines there. Um, and those don't seem to be coming back up. But non-routine jobs, these more creative jobs, these are not suffering the same kinds of problems. Um, I could show you more stuff, but, but basically, if you want to think about the labor market of the future, the good jobs of the past, people thought a good job was working in the factory, getting your paycheck, and so on. Those are not necessarily going to be the good jobs of the future, and, and that's not a bad thing at all. I mean, when I say Cooper or Smith, the first thing you guys think of is probably like Bradley or Will, and not the guy that makes your barrels or your horseshoes, right? And so good jobs of the past are, are not going to be good jobs of the future, and that's just a natural evolution of things. Um, and so, and, and the reason being is that, I mean, U.S. workers are being subject to greater competition. A lot of it's from automation and IT. If you're an accountant, I don't suggest, uh, I mean, that's not, that was a good job in the past, but TurboTax is coming for you. Um, but what you could do is potentially take those skills and, uh, and maybe like work towards the strategy of a particular company in terms of growing or something like that. Um, and, and there's also competition for labor abroad. So if you're a t-shirt manufacturer, that's not, a, that's not looking great for you now, but if you're a t-shirt designer, things are gonna be looking up for you. Um, and, and this isn't a bad thing either. Um, and so I think what's important is you wanna invest in skills that are difficult to replace. And this is precisely what sort of the creative economy is all about. And so, uh, yeah, the economy of the future is increasingly creative one, I think. I think that's pretty clear, pretty much anywhere you, anywhere you uh, slice it up. So, thanks. Thank you, Vikram. Oh, and there, the <laughs> buzzer went off. Perfect. Okay, so Alfred, who uh, will be speaking on uh, the benefit of film inside this sector. Do I, should I stay here? Okay, I'm comfortable, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, U of H, for hosting. And um, uh, I'm, my name is Alfred Cervantes. I'm with the Houston Film Commission. So we help people make films in Houston. How many people have heard of us? How many people ex know exactly what we do? Oh, that's not bad. Not bad, okay. Uh, I just want to make sure that um, you know who we are and what we do every day. I get that question all the time. Is um, The Houston Film Commission is a division of Houston First. So we are the smallest office, I believe, of Houston First. We are three people full time. And we market the city of Houston as a filmmaking destination. So um, we are all supported, as Houston First is, by hotel tax. And so uh, we work every day speaking with producers from Los Angeles, New York, uh, wherever they may be coming from, to uh, promote Houston and find their resources for them. Locations, crew, equipment is what we specialize in, physical production. We don't have... Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, much to do with the writing aspect, distribution, or talent. But where we come into the process is somebody has their project, they have their money, uh, or sometimes no money, but they're looking for a place to shoot. So we help them find all these things in the greater Houston area. Um, there are 13 film commissions in the, in the state of Texas. And so uh, there's all the major cities. And then, of course, the Texas Film Commission based in Austin, Texas, covers the whole state. And so... Um, we have a number of things on our website that are useful. Uh, someone mentioned that they're on our email list for film and video announcements. That's our cast and crew call page. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can sign up and get the um, local cast and crew calls in your mailbox. Um, but uh, there's a number of things. Now, uh, as far as economic impact, 
a film commission's professional organization is an organization called AFCI, Association of Film Commissions International. AFCI is an uh, international organization where they do a study every few years about the economic impact of film. And what they've come out with, the last study, is film, whatever your production budget is in an area, the economic impact is three times that physical production budget. So if we have a commercial that comes here from California, they spend $100,000 making their commercial locally, the economic impact is uh, roughly $300,000. I think the actual uh, uh, multiplier is 2.89 or something like that. So uh, we rely on their data that they do this economic film impact study for the uh, different regions every uh, few years. And so that's how we justify our existence. That's what we put in our reports, is how many projects we assist, how many actually happen, how many don't happen, and how many happen in other areas. And so we do our best to keep uh, track of those things. And so um, I'd like to... Um, thank the um, Houston Arts Alliance uh, because in the last number of years, um, uh, filmmakers are now considered artists, which is awesome. They are artists. Uh, filmmaking is the most collaborative art medium, and so you need a lot of people to help make a film. It takes a long time, and so there are many, many craftspeople that work behind the scenes to make a film happen, and so um, our local filmmakers are eligible for uh, uh, also Houston Arts Alliance grants, which is fantastic. Now, uh, you have economic impact through the way of film in production because when they come here, they do hire local craftspeople, they rent locations, they need to have food for these productions, all those things. And then of course, there's the um, exhibition uh, economic impact potentially from filmmaking as well. Um, so we have many, many film festivals throughout the year. Uh, Houston Cinema Arts Fest, of course, in November. Uh, we just had a uh, a niche film festival called Houston Latino uh, Film Festival, which was very well uh, received at TBH Center. Um, so, uh, which uh, I say that means there's a demand for it. it. It was over Easter weekend and the attendance was really good. So that's fantastic. And then uh, coming up uh, in June is Comic Palooza, which is now the second largest uh, convention of its type here in the state of Texas. And so uh, last summer when Comic Palooza happened, they were estimating about 50,000 people over the weekend were gonna be going through the George R. Brown Convention Center uh, to uh, meet stars, to uh, take, uh, take part of the panel Panels, all these things. If, if you haven't heard, um, it's the first U.S. reunion of the cast of Aliens, the movie Aliens. So that's going to happen at Comic Palooza. And um, I've been told, um, I think I can say this out loud, um, that NASA has had a presence and NASA has done a film contest this last year with Houston Cinema Arts Festival. But I believe you're going to be able to take moon buggy rides at Comic Palooza as well. So, for, yes, exactly, for, for what it's worth. So, um, that's coming up. Now, um, in the beginning, um, Christine mentioned that we are late to the game and um, really looking at creative economies and taking them seriously. Uh, of course, um, as you mentioned, uh, when you say the, uh, the names uh, Cooper and Willis, you immediately think of stars and so, uh, or the, the actors. And so, um, the Texas Film Commission has just started something on their website called Texas Film Trails. And what they're doing is they are making maps you can uh, get on their website uh, where you can follow the movies of particular filmmakers that are shot all over the state. So basically, uh, everyone's heard of Field of Dreams. Uh, after that movie was made, it became a, a film tourism destination. And so now Texas is putting together maps of film locations for people to go by and look at. Of course, we've had Rushmore shot here, Reality Bites, Apollo 13, a number of movies. And so uh, the, the first uh, film trail that's on their website is the films of Richard Linkletter. And so, of course, he shot the movie Boy hood here for four years and so the locations in Houston are on there for the movie boyhood if people want to find that and go visit these locations and so um, and that is another one there's a Twitter account called uh, OLV on location vacations and so uh, for film fans you can follow them on Twitter and see where people are filming movies all over the country and so um, I don't know why I just gave them a plug I have no idea but if anyone's interested in that. Now, something that's also important, not only uh, as promoting uh, the film economy and the way of production and exhibition here is, um, of course, our primary um, uh, business in film is commercials and corporate video that is ongoing. Uh, I've been saying recently that we're very lucky that we have um, 
the uh, that we have uh, James Harden and JJ Watt selling everything. So uh, there's plenty of commercials being shot all the time with the, our sports figures in them. Uh, but uh, the local um, American Ad Federation Houston started an initiative a while ago called Only in Houston because something um, that exists in film and also in advertising is that we would love our local businesses to use our local creative companies. And so local ad agencies, local uh, uh, craftspeople, all this, instead of bringing people in from out of town. So there's plenty of talented people here in Houston. And so um, there's an Only in Houston Facebook page that has over 9,000 people on it. And so that's pretty significant. Uh, Only in Houston on Facebook, it's an initiative of the local American Ad Federation chapter. And so, um, can I say one more thing? Okay. Um, I think it's a very exciting time to be an independent filmmaker here in Houston. Um, what's been happening is there are more grants up. Uh, Europe has always looked at filmmaking as preserving their culture, and American uh, USA doesn't. It's a business, and so uh, we're jealous of the filmmakers that come from Europe that are funded by the Irish Film Board, by BBC, by Film4, all these things. And so now uh, here we are fortunate that we people uh, HAA is, uh, in particular is giving filmmakers grants for their work, uh, short films and feature filmmakers. So uh, what's going to happen next year in 2017 for you filmmakers out there? Or please let people know. Is is that there's going to be, um, there are some grants that are available every year. The Austin Film Society grant, which gives up to $15,000 per dollars per film project. Uh, there's uh, every other year we've been, uh, we've had this Houston Filmmaker Grant, which is funded by a number of organizations where a filmmaker, a feature filmmaker can get a $30,000 matching funds grant. And then of course, uh, HAA has been providing local filmmakers with either uh, for feature films, either a $10,000 grant or for short films, a $5,000 grant. So in 2017, if there's a local independent feature filmmaker that's making an independent feature film under 250 50,000. They could potentially get grants from all three of those sources, Houston Arts Alliance, Houston Filmmaker Grant, and the Austin Film Society Grant, and all that adds up to $55,000. If there's somebody who has uh, all their ducks in a row, their budget spelled out, and, and serious about what they do, they want to see that a filmmaker has seen films com from, from uh, uh, inception to completion and that they can tell a story. So, uh, But anyway, that's uh, for filmmakers in 2017 coming up, a great opportunity. So thank you all very much. If I could just add uh, one question to that, how have we seen, we know that this is a great example though of how we really are behind peer cities, the largest of the other cities, American cities. How are we catching up? Um, I think we're, we're catching up. You know, it's uh, what we try to do. Uh, it's all about spreading information. Uh, Houston is huge, and I, it's wonderful that this group uh, can come together and also share this information with other artists you know. Um, we, uh, it's always a struggle, you know. Uh, what From a filmmaking point of view, what I always love to see is that a If you don't make a film for no one to see it. You want to get it out there as wide as possible. A recent example that was at the Sundance Theater last, actually the last couple of weeks, uh, was a locally made independent feature film called Cresha. Uh, Cresha was made in Magnolia, Texas, just north of Houston. It's a debut feature film uh, that won a lot of awards on the festival circuit last year. And it was just in the Sundance cinemas. It was li uh, released th limited theatrical around the country. And um, the storyline, um, it's a Thanksgiving family story. And as I say about most Thanksgiving family stories, stories it was a horror film. So, um, <laughs> but Trey Edward Schultz, Trey Edward Schultz who made the film, uh, he's now already got another deal to make another film with a studio out of Los Angeles. And so uh, we, what we want to do is we, we want to help uh, filmmakers make the best film they can and get it out nationwide. That's how we get attention for our area. That's great. Thank you so much. So we'd now like to move um, to Kelly. Kelly. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm an artist, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'll just use my few minutes to remind you all why it's important to support and pay artists and creatives money. Because <laughs> that's what we need. <laughs> um, 
my visuals don't really uh, aren't exactly in sync with what I'm saying. I just wanted to show you a few things about, you know, my life as an artist. Uh, this is a picture of me on press uh, publishing a book. Uh, different commissions that I've done um, for uh, different spaces. This was installed last May at the Lawndale here in town. This was at the Galveston Art Center. So I'm, I've only lived in Houston three years, but I feel very embraced um, and very welcomed um, as an artist. Uh, and that I think is to Houston's credit uh, of, how, of how great and vibrant the art um, scene is. Uh, before uh, I lived in New York City for 10 years and I definitely didn't feel like the quality of life was as high for an artist. One, I'm older now and higher up on the, the ladder of creative jobs. I make more money. Um, so that's useful compared to when I lived in New York City. But I think that the quality of life here in Houston has to do with housing prices and food prices being slightly better than New York City. Um, and our creative um, sector and creative economy definitely growing, you know, uh, uh, compared to other cities. Um, but in terms of artists needing support, uh, artists are not only, and I'm using artists in a grand sense, like in, instead of the word creatives, because uh, I kind of, you know, so all makers, basically uh, we're not only providing all this content, like all this um, great art and great music and great theater and film, but we connect, we're the connectors between so many different sectors uh, within the within culture and within the economy. Like we're, we're friends, not just hiring people and dealing with people, but literally like friendships between all these different classes and groups, like the dealers, the, like the art dealers, the consumers, um, in terms of like the general art going public, uh, the curators, uh, the artisans that are helping us make our work. We hire interns, we hire assistants, we pay a lot of people um, to help us do what we do in terms of framing, in terms of um, labs, um, retail shops, junk shops, um, you know, people, carpenters, uh, all kinds of people we're, we're hiring. Um, so uh, we, we don't just spend money that we get, we also um, use the capital of when we work with an institution, uh, we are really good advertisers. We gossip, we talk amongst ourselves. We, um, I travel all over the country. Creatives are often traveling and going to this conference or that conference or that art fair or that show or that museum. And everywhere I go, I talk about how great the art institutions in Houston are. Um, so we, we are kind of I, I wouldn't think of us as free advertising, but we are really, really powerful in terms of our networks, in terms of like all the artists that I know through critique groups, through my colleagues, through my students, through my friends. And so we have this huge, huge network that um, the creative economy can tap into and does already. I just, again, I'm just here reminding you um, how important creatives are, not just in providing content, um, but to really use us as a connecting force between a lot of major um, different sectors within the economy. Uh, this is an example of uh, me shooting a commission por portrait and the, the resulting po portrait. And this is uh, one of my colleague's daughters. Um, this is a picture of my new studio in Southwest Houston, which I'm very, very um, happy to have. I'm still kind of pinching myself. I've been an artist uh, for 20 years, I would say, and this is my first like quote unquote real studio, other than a few that I've rented, you know, just a few months here and there. Um, and this is a, a 20 by 24 abstract uh, tintype piece that I've been working on recently in my uh, studio. That's both, this is the upstairs part of the studio, uh, and then downstairs the garage. Um, part of the studio is the dark room and messy.
$2,500 or $20,000 so that we can make and spend, you know, even more money. I really believe that we, you know, if you give creatives more money, more money will get out into the economy. And it's not just um, when we're quote creating, it's also when we're doing the jobs uh, within this, like when we're teaching, uh, when we're the administrators, I, you have no idea how many artists I've worked with that have been in administrative roles in terms of curating, um, being nonprofits, arts organizations. Um, and so we, we need those um, salaries to go up as well. So it's not just a matter of, of getting more money to do certain types of art events, but really all the people working in, in, within the industry kind of need h higher salaries. Um, I really can't, you know, kind of say that enough. Um, uh, you know, granted, um, I, you know, I don't want this, I didn't want my um, spiel to be just about what we need, but also just to remind everyone of, of how important uh, creatives are within this whole um, economy. Thank you. You know, I'd like to just make a couple of really quick comments as we move into uh, the final speaker, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, uh, this was noted earlier, but I, I think it's important to underscore it again. Um, when we collectively, over the, the many years now, we've been measuring the nonprofit arts um, sector from an economic perspective, and interesting takeaway with that is the number of individuals employed in that strictly the nonprofit is in the low 20,000s. Not bad, but when you're talking about the number of people inside education or law or other uh, professions, um, not so large. When we started looking at creative economy, it jumped to way over 150,000, which puts us at 50% larger than the medical center. So the collective power of this room and the field at large becomes exponentially larger. Um, and I think if you all could kind of think about that um, as we move into Q&A. The other thing, um, if you could think about, uh, and you touched on this a little bit, deficits in, re in resources, specifically here in Houston, many of us have um, even if we were raised here, we've come back to Houston to do a bit to um, create our careers and our lives here. What are those deficits that we need to be looking at? And then uh, on the other hand, what are surprising assets that you may not have thought about earlier in your career that you have found here? So with that said, I want to turn it over to um, Deborah Colton um, to talk uh, to us about um, the gallery world. Well, um, first of all, I'd really just like to say how happy I am to see so many of the faces that are here today and that Jonathan Bluss and Houston Arts Alliance and this, um, this wonderful concept and uh, the University of Houston has put this together because I probably have always looked at things a little more from a like Jonathan said when he introduced me, a global perspective, because we lived overseas for eight years, and I, because my husband's company with Exxon, a position with Exxon Mobil, um, over our 35-year uh, marriage so far, um, I've lived in many places. So when we came back to Asia, uh, to Houston in 2000, um, I looked at it from an inside perspective because we had lived here in the 80s when we first got married but from a global or outside perspective in terms of how the city was being perceived um, outside the city um, nationally and internationally and what I had heard over the years and living in other places, being away since 1984 to 2000. Um, so um, in any case, I'm really happy to see everyone who's here, here because you represent so many of the integral uh, sectors of uh, of the uh, creative economy combined um, because none of us can do it on our own. You know, I can do the best, you know, wonderful international gallery shows or try to promote our lo local artists and revere our art history. But without the patrons, without the artists, without the press, 
um, without the nonprofits and the museums, we don't, we're not really going to get very far. And I think that's really kind of true in any of the entities. Um, the artists can't just be on their own. They need this whole, you know, combination of components. Um, the museums can't do it on their own. The nonprofits can't do it on their own. But when you put us all together, it makes this dynamic team. So what I'm really, really pleased about, and I commend Jonathan over the years for always putting these things, tanks together and getting and, and looking at our city from an analytical perspective is how we can, how, how can we connect these dots and empower all these entities and make the city this strong destination city of the arts that we all know it is, but maybe not everyone else in the world knows yet. So, um, you know, I've seen since 2000 when we came back, really vast changes. And, uh, you know, um, I, I was, you know, I, we, we, I was in, involved in the arts because my husband was the CEO of, of ESSO uh, over in Thailand. So when I moved back and I've been supporting the arts in, uh, in Asia, um, it turned out that the American embassy in Bangkok told me that Houston and the Council Forum Corp was honoring Thailand in 2000 and needed a cultural highlight. So if that hadn't happened, I might not be here uh, today. In fact, I probably wouldn't be. Uh, but I curated a show of the Thai artists, the national artists, put it on a boat and moved to Houston. And it went into uh, Sue Allen Center in conjunction with the, um, the uh, uh, Council Forum 2000 and uh, the Asia Society. And we put up Asia Society signs all over to create an awareness in Houston of what uh, Asian art would be like for the new Asia House and now the Asia Society building that it is today. Um, and then, um, you know, even in terms of the uh, Middle East component, um, that's gotten so much stronger now. Um, you know, our our gallery was the first, uh, the only American gallery to go over to the Abu Dhabi Art Paris uh, Art Fair in 2007, its first year. And, um, you know, when I came back, knowing a lot of the council, councilors, uh, Charles Foster and a number of others, I said, you know, you, Houston really needs to, you know, honor uh, a, a, a Middle Eastern country. So in 2008, they honored Qatar I, or, or Qatar, it's pronounced either way, depending on the circles you're speaking to. But, uh, but then I did the cultural highlight uh, on that. And, um, you know, you look at organizations like PhotoFest and what they've done and always being on the cutting edge of, uh, you know, what's going on throughout the world. Uh, you know, their emphasis on the Middle East in 2010, their emphasis, no, 2008, their emphasis on China. Um, what's happening the, uh, the, with the MFA now, the Cheney Red Hot uh, Collection show that was back in 2007 um, and how uh, Robert got so many of the other galleries and institutions to, to, uh, to, to show contemporary Chinese art at the same time. You know, there's been all these unifying uh, things to, to make us more of a uh, culturally rich, diverse, international destination city of the arts. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, you know, happening in amazing ways now. Um, I, I look at it, I know I look at things from a little different perspective because I lived over in Asia for eight years. But if you look at Singapore, for example, it's really just an island with barely no resources whatsoever. But it is the, the business hub of Asia. It's not China, it's not uh, Japan, it's Singapore. It's this tiny little island. And I compare Houston to that in the sense that, uh, of course, we're, we're massively big and have amazing resources. So we're really much better than Singapore in many ways, but we are a uh, melting pot of, uh, of, of diversity in terms of, uh, you know, just like Singapore. Uh, um, you know, I read in the Chronicle a few months ago that 40% of the people that live in Houston were born in other countries. And I think that, uh, and a lot of those people are our major business leaders, uh, doctors, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, real power people in the city and they're supporting the arts. I feel like they need to do it. You know, we need to all get everyone even more 
excited and inspired to do more, but they are supporting the arts and, um, uh, and, and, and that's helping a lot in terms of uh, the Islamic wing in the MFA, the uh, Asia Society building, um, you know, uh, the Latin America wing and all the Latin Americans that are here now. So um, now the, the demographics have changed in the city. That's kind of more the international perspective and how we've grown and it's all very positive. Um, the artist studio area, you know, I moved to the artist studio area when it was kind of destitutional over there. And, uh, you know, um, uh, and of course, we all know how it's changed now. And it's really one of the biggest artist studio areas in the United States now. But I pose a question, how has that changed the demographics of the economy, uh, the, the creative economy, when artists are, uh, you know, going ahead and, uh, you know, feeling that maybe they don't need uh, the galleries anymore and they can, you know, it, it changes the demographics. And I feel that if the galleries continue to become full scale galleries where they're not only just selling work off the walls like artists can do in their studios, but go back to the tradition of what galleries, how the galleries formed in Europe, which they were patron galleries and, and the, 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 the art, the, the galleries um, for, made, you know, created the galleries to support artists' career, but also to promote their career, not just to sell off the walls, but to promote them. And now, if you look at the best galleries in the United States, there's hubs of them in New York, LA. We have some very good ones here, like Sicardi Gallery and a number of others. But, um, you know, we want more galleries in Houston to represent artists uh, and, and they view new work here. Um, you know, we have artists at Deborah Colton Gallery from Egypt, from uh, Russia, and in our consignment agreements with them and representation, we represent them to the Americas and the United States. Well, if more of that is done, where we're debuting the, the work here, then it means our artists don't need to go to New York or LA to get their rubber stamps anymore because we're showing we're a strong entity. We have we we represent artists throughout the Americas and uh, and we know how to promote them nationally and internationally and get them into other museums and such. So I feel like the city is there now and we have a ton of good galleries and we have to just keep raising the bar and all uniting together the nonprofits, the museums, all the institutions, the patrons, the, the press. You know, I'm so happy to see art the, the head of Arts and Culture magazine here. Um, none of us, you know, none of us can exist or promote ourselves on our own. Like we can all do great things in the city, but without uh, social media, without the, the press, and it's really important that we all support the media here so that they can get stronger, get more critical writers, uh, and, um, and cover everything that's going on in the city. So in any case, I talked a little over, but thank you. Deborah, thank you so much. And I do want to make a, a point that Deborah has been one of our biggest advocates uh, in taking the gallery um, all over the world, um, which is one of the easiest way to promote arts and culture for this city. So thank you, Deborah, for all you've done. So, um, Mr. Sixto, I believe we're a few minutes behind. Did you want to turn over to Q and A in the audience? Question. My name, <clears throat> my name is Birgit van Mike. I'm the uh, board president of Ars Lyrica. Oh. I'm also the co-founder of the Houston Early Music Festival, and I'm the Texas board member of Early Music America. I'm very impressed by this esteemed board, especially that there's also an economist. We've heard a lot about the visual arts. We have heard nothing about the small music organizations in this city. Match is already fantastic. That is a huge initiative. I've also observed, I'm originally from Germany. Um, I came, we came as a family with my ex-husband who was in the, or still is in the petrochemical business. So of course Houston is the, 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 the heart of the petrochemical industry uh, globally. And so I come with a background from subsidized arts in uh, Germany, in the Netherlands. And, uh, very much admire what happens here in this country that corporations uh, and arts organizations work together 
I also, I'm also a businesswoman. My, my whole life was marketing and PR. I also was once owner of a helicopter charter company. So I'm flying high. And now I'm flying high with urban music, non for profit. And um, HA has been a very good organization for us. We always think we'll get bored from HA. HA! <laughs> but uh, what I'm really missing here on this panel is there are no representation of small music organizations. Uh, I think there is a really a big role. I've seen that the city has been fantastic in uh, developing parks and recreations, understanding that that's the way to bring people to Houston. And uh, visual arts are very important with fantastic organizations. But small music organizations are struggling, especially since we lost our radio station. It's not personal, but we had our last concert was uh, in Eastern Messiah. It should have been a full house. But our demographic are the affluent middle aged to uh, baby boomers who don't tune in all these more modern stuff, as I call it myself. I'm old. And uh, so we've lost the forum. We've lost the people who listen to the radio uh, on their way uh, on, on, on their way to work and come to these concerts. So there, there is a huge gap to fill to help us small arts organizations. I'm not only talking about us Lyrica, I'm talking about Houston Urban Music, uh, Bach Society. And so there is a gap and there is a, a, a mission for the cultural leaders here in the city to help us and make us grow. I think I can answer um, uh, the part about the small uh, music. We can't get everybody on stage, unfortunately. Um, but part of the, what we are looking throughout the entire day is how do um, how can we represent some of this, these sectors and how is not small nonprofit, which is either performing or visual arts, it's still basically a nonprofit. And how small to mid-sized nonprofits still continue to function within the same sector. And how do we work with our commercial sectors? How do we work across into a more more commercial sectors and how do we and, and corporate aspects and also working with private industry. So it's not, I think, only about um, the organizations that are represented on the stage, but how are we actually thinking about that broader? And how are we thinking about that not just about Houston, but really what is indicative in relationship to this city, this the state, as well as to this region? Um, Texas, of course, has the lowest, uh, actually one of the lowest state, um, uh, the second to lowest uh, actual uh, arts funding to the state. That's part of what we need to be talking about today, is that how are we all working together in order to be, like if uh, creative economies and creative industries are going to be pushing the needle in relationship to policy, then how do we work together? Small nonprofit music, small nonprofit gallery, or actually a for-profit gallery come together in order to help in those aspects of political forums and beyond. So uh, I think, are there any relationship in like in victim? I think you were talking earlier about the economic aspects and same with you with Alfred, like how are we actually doing in terms of that, those sector, in terms of the commercial sector or in terms of the economic sector in um, and, and moving that needle like, locally for, uh, I don't know, Jonathan, what am I trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would just say one thing. Um, and this is the only uh, criticism that I would make of what Christine said is that I think I think any kind of exercise that she tried to do is necessarily going to understate the value of a creative sector. And I think the reason being is it's really hard to measure. That's sort of what I was trying to get at when I was talking about. And I mean, it's not her fault. This is just this is a really difficult thing to do. So I think um, trying to put a number as, as an economist, I'm really, really uncomfortable trying to Put a number on the value of a creative economy because I think it's really, really difficult to value um, art. For example, uh, this is a question that's been going on at least since Aristotle, and I think we've gotten a little bit better at it. But it's it's just a very difficult question, and so I think instead of trying to put on these these really these these big numbers that are even then still too small, and trying to justify what these numbers are. It's important to think in terms of sort of these broad secular trends in the economy, what's going on. And that's what I was trying to get at, that in, in a broad sense, the returns to creativity are increasing and the returns to creativity are gonna outpace the returns to, to routine, manual, non-cognitive work in the future. And that's just, that's just the fact of the matter. It doesn't have to do necessarily with any particular policies. It has to do with the fact that 
we're an integrated world and we have computers. And so I think that's the way that if, if I was trying to sell um, a creative economy and, and arts to the world, I think that's the way that, that I would do it. Um, and I'm, I get that I'm an outsider here, uh, but, but I think it's a very uh, strong argument that can be made. Um, may I just add really quick, one, one small um, tangible thing that I think could be really helpful is putting more creatives and people in the creative industry on boards. Speaking of, of, of all the boards you know, that, that you're on, I think the more uh, people, uh, creatives on, that are influencing big decisions, the, the better. And I think in some ways, often boards, um, and, and absolutely no offense to, to all of you who are on boards, um, sometimes boards uh, exclude people because of um, because financial burdens that, that boards often ask for or financial gifts. And so I think that is a really small thing that could change a lot for the better to put more creatives on boards. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I think mm -hmm. creatives definitely need a lot more economic and business advice. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'd like to uh, agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, I noticed when um, Exxon moved their executive headquarters from Rockefeller Center, New York, to uh, Los Clinas or Irving near Dallas, that a lot of the major court, a lot of the uh, major uh, executives didn't really want to move, and it was because in 1989, Dallas didn't really have much going on in the arts. So I think the more you can integrate business executives with the nonprofits and the creatives and get them, you know, they are involved. But the more you can integrate them, that's a really good way to get them more involved in and get them to support the arts more because that the infrastructure of the corporate sector really is necessary uh, you know to to support all the nonprofits and the artists um apropos of, excuse me uh, i'm pat jasper and i'm with the houston arts alliance um apropos of the last comment but really uh going back to some of the comments that transpired in Christine's talk and her discussion with Jonathan and everything we've heard on this panel. Um, I want to ask the question of this group, but kind of of the conference in general, about the whole issue of arts and economic development. Um, the arts have been at the economic development table for a long time, and probably one of the best arguments that we have heard for that was, um, and I'm afraid I don't recall your name, but the artist who spoke uh, so eloquently about how every dollar you earn goes back into our economy and spreads itself out. So we know that the arts are a multiplier from an economic development perspective, and that has always been the argument for, for instance, using hotel motel tax dollars. I'd like to know, however, what we're doing to position ourselves in terms of economic development and drawing down dollars for the creative economy and community. A good example being that uh, several years ago, the Greater Houston Partnership uh, did a major initiative called Opportunity Houston, I believe, and they raised millions of dollars. I believe it was 20 or 30 million. Am I 30, right, Jonathan? 36. Yeah. And it was specifically raised to increase job opportunities in Houston to make this city a more robust place. I can pretty much assure you that except inadvertently, none of those dollars went to creatives or creative industries. Um, so my question to this whole conference, but to this panel as well is, how do we reposition our place at the economic development table? How do we become a part of pulling down those dollars to fuel, for instance, the 59% that is imported into this city to, to make the creative economy happen? Hope that's not too oblique a question. Thank you, Sixto. 
Actually, I think it's a perfect question to be talking about over lunch um, because <laughs> we are really that far behind. Um, uh, it is actually coming back to the question, the overall question is like really how do we want to advance the creative economy in Houston? How do we actually be pushing, how can we individually and collectively move that needle? And how do we work together um, in this? And what is your part? And that is what the index card is there for. That was the question to see um, what are your steps moving that forward? Um, so before we uh, break for lunch, because the sandwiches are out there, I want to thank the panel and the panelists respondents for all of their brilliant thoughts.